Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 13, Episode 106. He's Dave Brian. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here this Monday, Steelers Nation. Dave, have a jam-packed show after a very busy weekend, so let's jump on in. Dave, how you doing? I'm doing good. I know, I, I, I know where Mike Tomlin is today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't have to squint to find Coach T. Today. Yeah, he's out in Arizona at the uh, annual NFL owners meetings and uh, just uh, recently wrapped up uh, uh, the annual AFC coaches breakfast media sessions and all. And uh, his probably wasn't as interesting as the John Harbaugh one, right? <laughs> and that's a very good thing. Yeah, the quick news, and we'll talk about it maybe a bit more later, is Lamar Jackson tweeting just at the time John Harbaugh speaking with reporters that Jackson requested a trade out of Baltimore March 2nd. And so that saga continues. Yeah, going to be interesting to watch that play out. I, you know, my gut still, t- you know, look, this this is posturing, right? You know, it's no mistake that Lamar did this right at the time that uh, mm-hmm. that John Harbaugh sat down, you know, for for his media session there to uh, I I. My gut tells me this is posturing and to hear John Harbaugh speak on and all like that. Uh, my gut still says they find a way to make that work out with him, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I really don't know how this thing will get resolved. Certainly just ratcheted up a little bit. But Dave, let's focus on the Pittsburgh Steelers. So much to discuss today. We'll get to Mike Tomlin, what he has to say at the owners meetings here in a little bit. But we'll start here from a couple of days ago with a a re-signing and a new addition to the Steelers roster. We'll start with the re-signing tight end Zach Gentry returning on a one-year deal. And so he had been on the market for a couple of weeks. Obviously, not a lot of takers out there, it appears. And so Gentry coming back to Pittsburgh. Yeah, one-year deal. We don't have the specifics on it uh, yet as far as the financials go. But, uh, you know, I'm I'm waiting... Waiting with uh, uh, much intent on seeing the numbers here. I, I, you know, I wrote about this several weeks ago that the Steelers have had two real candidates for one of those four-year qualifying contracts, uh, which is you know what uh, Terrell Edmonds signed uh, last season. That obviously uh, comes with a 1.35 million dollar uh, benefit. Uh, as part of that, you can give a player up to $152,500 as a signing bonus. As part of that, uh, I, you know, look, one or two players, you know, best qualified for such that contract. And he was one of them. And Edmonds obviously signed with the Philadelphia Eagles. I don't know. We'll see how this turns out. But uh, and it's kind of curious, too. It came the day after Terrell Edmonds you know, sign with the Eagles. So is, you know, my theory, at least my speculation on this is that, you know, they had this because look, though, here's the thing about that kind of contract. You can sign up to two players to that contract, but you have to decide there's only the $1.35 million benefit that goes along with it. So if you sign two players, do you want to give that benefit, uh, apply that benefit to one player specifically and give him the extra money? Or do you want to split it between the two players? Well, obviously with Edmonds out of the picture now, you know, if you offer that same contract to, to, to Gentry, you could give him the full $1.35 million benefit, which you know would actually put a little bit more money in his pocket there. So uh, I, I got my tinfoil hat on real, real super tight uh, <laughs> uh, after the Gentry signing happened. And I'm quite interested to see if this will wind up being you know, uh, exactly what I stated in, in a four-year qualifying contract. And if it does, you know, and if the max signing bonus was given of 152,500, and if that's the only guaranteed portion of the contract, well, then in my opinion, Alex, this still opens up the possibility that this team, you know, could address the tight end position in the draft. 
Sure. I was just going to ask you that question to follow up and get your thoughts on does bringing Gentry back kind of set the tight end room or does it still leave it open? So, but if they're going to draft a tight end, then you got to go pretty early. Otherwise, why bring in another like late round pick to compete with that group and probably not make it? So I feel like you could add, but if you're going to do it, you want to do it in a pretty big and meaningful way. Is one of the first four rounds considered early in your eyes or, or are you thinking earlier than that? I would say day one or day two would kind of be my rough criteria. Because I'm thinking more along the lines of at least by the fourth round. Okay, so we're pretty much the same. I I think maybe me first uh, four picks there, you're thinking the first five. Um, It's a strong tight end class, and there's some good blockers in this class. But, you know, Gentry did not have as good of a 2022 as he did in 2021 as a blocker, and he'll have to get better and play to that size. But they like his size, his frame, and again, kind of goes back to they want to run the heck out of the football this year. Mike Tomlin made comments that reinforced that yesterday. We'll get to uh, later in the show. And so Gentry has to be better, but has that size and frame this team covets. Yeah, I'd look, I, I'm not saying they will draft one. I'm just saying it 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 leaves the position open as, you know, a, a possibility when it comes to the draft. Do you think any pick? Are we talking like 32 could even be a possibility if a Darnell Washington is sitting there? I mean, I don't want to rule it out, but in in my head, exactly where my head went is potentially fourth round. Okay. I want any names because at that point you wonder, it's a strong tight end class, but will most of those top I have, names I have a gone? name, but I was going to sit on it. But Okay. Well, you can sit. Uh, if you, you don't have to tell me. I mean, you know, they went to Michigan, right? Luke Schoonmaker would, okay. would, would uh, potentially, I think, fit fit in that in that area there, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Have you watched his tape? I really haven't gotten in the tape. Just, much yet. just, a, just a little bit. And you know, what impressed me is him as a blocker and this team could use an upgrade as a blocking tight end. Right. Yeah. And they just drafted a Michigan tight end. They may draft another one uh, with Gentry, of course, going to Michigan uh, when Pittsburgh took him in 2019. So that is the story on Gentry. And of course the biggest news here, uh, assuming the Gentry makes the roster is grilling and chilling. We'll be back in 2023 at least for training camp (laughs) at least for training camp yeah maybe and listen if gentry gets cut then maybe he has some time on his hands to continue to pursue grilling and chilling though the format would have to be different anyway uh so that is do you think they should upgrade the tight end the second tight end position if they get get a chance to well again i think it goes back to what do you want to be offensively if you want to become that really ultra heavy like cleveland was in the past and like baltimore is currently that 12 personnel base offense then sure if it's going to be a, where a guy is going to be playing a couple hundred snaps a year, 300, 400, not be super involved, then I think it becomes less of a, of a need. It becomes a bit more of a want. And so it just kind of depends on what structure you want your offense to be. Although at this point, with, with uncertainty at the slot receiver position, you know, being a, a base 12 personnel offense is not a terrible idea. Not at all. Not at all. Sign me up for that. And look, I mean, you know, what 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 do the moves so far this offseason kind of speak to? You know, more aggressive offensive line. We'll obviously see, you know, uh, what happens in a draft at potentially maybe a tackle position and all like that. And, you know, kind of parlay some of the things that Mike Tomlin uh, even said, you know, uh, uh, Sunday night at the owners meeting there, you know, not going to be. Uh, I, I'm paraphrasing here, you know, apologetic that, you know, our, our intentions are maybe to run the football more or, or better, you know? So I, I think that could uh, uh, play along with it. Look, I, I, you know, uh, you don't have to twist my arm to sign up to watch a team run the football extremely well and, and create explosive plays in the passing game. Sure. We've talked about that. You know, for several weeks, the Pittsburgh's identity from the guys they've signed to the players they've shown interest in in the draft. They want big physical people up front. That's the identity they're they're building. Uh, they created and kind of found that identity the back half of last year. Now they want to put the people in place to really accelerate and maximize that identity. And, and that's all continued by uh, the moves Pittsburgh has been making in the Tom, uh, the comments that Mike Tomlin has been saying. OK. All right, so that was the re-signing. The new signing to a, a fellow uh, one-year deal is offensive tackle LaRaven Clark. And so on Friday's show, Dave, we were just talking about this team is going that a veteran offensive tackle that has experience on the left side, right side, somebody versatile. And then a couple hours later, it is LaRaven Clark, formerly of the Tennessee Titans, 
uh, draft pick of the Colts back in the third round in 2016. And there's another Andy Weidel connection. Clark was in Philadelphia in 2021. And so make that three offensive linemen coming over um, who were ex Eagles and have that Weidel connection. So Clark, the latest, wouldn't call him the greatest, but I will call him the latest uh, signing for the Steelers. Look, they uh, they had to add to that room somehow, some way. And uh, uh, also, there was the news that uh, 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 Trent Scott signed with who? Washington. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, this is the contract with LaRaven Clark is a uh, uh, veteran benefit contract. Uh, they only gave him a $50,000 signing bonus. That might be $50,000 too much. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's all you have invested uh, in him. They had, regardless of what happens, you know, ultimately happens in a draft, they had to add to that room. Uh, he, he, you know, he does have playtime experience. He does have starter experience. He does have experience on playing uh, both tackle spots. Uh, but it's a very much uh, looking at his tape and you, you, you obviously did a quick film room on him as well, too. It's, it's break glass in case of emergency situation with him. Yeah. If, for anyone wondering and asking me the question, does this prevent the Steelers from drafting a tackle? No, it does not. And they still better draft a tackle because you don't want the Raven Clark playing significant snaps for your team. He's essentially this year's Trent Scott, but hopefully will not be the number three, be the number four, who certainly has no guarantee to even make the team uh, out of training camp, out of uh, the preseason, out of the summer. So his run blocking, I would say, is a bit better than Trent Scott. Um, He's been used as a tackle eligible occasionally, similar to how Scott was employed last year. He's a big guy, big lower half, great length, 36 inch arms. He's played left tackle, right tackle and right guard, and so there's versatility there, and Pittsburgh should be the swing guy playing left and right tackle, but in pass protection, Dave, it is a struggle. He allows a really short corner, cannot defend speed rushes laterally, um, just does not get a lot of width and depth out of his set, and just really one of the poorest pass protectors you're going to see. So he's got some anchor, some power, but defending swipes and outside rushes to to that uh, outside shoulder, he is going to be just a disaster. Yeah. Uh, once again, we'll see what this team does in the draft and all like that. But the, the hope is that ultimately, you know, if he does make the 53 man roster, we're talking about a, a game day inactive here. Yeah, absolutely. But like we said, this team had to get some depth there, some other option before the draft, not going to the draft with just two offensive tackles and just somebody that's played both the left and right side before and trying to find a tackle this time of year, several weeks into free agency the options were not going to be good, um, especially anything cheap. And so, you know, not expecting Clark to be an all-star, but just giving an accurate representation of, of what his game has been. Mm-hmm. But again, they want big guys. And and Clark isn't especially tall, but he's really long. And so that goes back to just the build and the length. And those are things Pittsburgh has really prioritized. And so it really feels like Andy Weidel, maybe his biggest impact so far has been bringing in some of this offensive linemen. Right. Uh, exactly. And look, I mean, uh, you only got three under contract now and, you know, they'll probably draft at least one, you know, you would think at least one uh, this year. And in other words, uh, more tackles are on the way. I don't know how they come. Once again, one likely to come via the draft. Uh, we'll see what comes out of these, you know, USFL and, 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 and the likes like that, but, uh, they are going to continue. And, you know, obviously you've got undrafted free agents that you can probably add from as well, but, uh, uh, they're not done adding to that room in addition to the draft. I don't think. No, not at all. They're going to draft somebody. It's a question of how early you know, is it 17, 32, 49. I don't know where, but they're going to draft a tackle. A uh, little doubt in my mind about that. So you had a re-signing, you had a new signing, and you had a visit on Friday with Bud Dupree uh, reportedly visiting did, did, the Steelers. Did that happen on Friday? Well, or yeah, was I was, it? yeah, I was just going to follow up. It's actually don't know for sure if that happened on Friday or if that was coming soon. But the news came out Friday okay. that Dupree was going to visit. So I, good correction there. That I don't know if that was today or Friday or over the weekend. Um, but that's it's it's coming. It's happened somewhere around there. And so Dupree. Um, you know, making the trip to Pittsburgh and where it goes from there, we'll see. But that just uh, confirms all the reports uh, earlier in the offseason. The Pittsburgh had interest and now they get to check the health and the contract and all those things. Yeah. Look, uh, how much is too much for him? 
uh, uh, and and what kind of ang you know, assuming that you know the physical checks out and all like that. Uh, I kind of envision I don't know two years, eight million, something like that. Yeah, that sounds right. You know, does Dupree want to take it? I mean, this is a guy that just had a his last contract was eighty two million, and so it's a big drop off and justified because he's been you know hurt and not been the same player. But you know he's going to have to swallow his pride to want to be a backup and take a a big pay cut from what he he was getting on his last contract. So it's a you know good scheme fit for him, and they'll be familiar with him. He can play both sides, so I understand the the allure. But you got to check the health. He is thirty. He's you know had the knee issues. And his production overall has fallen fallen off. Yeah, you would think too. The, you know, kind of the max kind of cap hit they would want to try to wedge in there at this point would probably be on the high side uh, uh, of four million dollars. And you know, this is this good chance. This is this is Bud Dupree's last stop. You know, of his career. So can they get him to agree to something like a two year deal or, you know, for for eight million? And I don't know, maybe put a roster bonus in for March for next March in there to kind of force 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 a decision on both sides. That way, if, if the Steelers did have plans on cutting bait with them, it, it, it would force them to do it early. And then that obviously would give uh, uh, give uh, Bud Dupree you know, an opportunity to maybe catch on elsewhere, but that's immediately kind of the, the value that I have in my head. Uh, if you did do something along the lines of a two year, $8 million contract, it would, it, it, it should result in his cap hit being under 3 million in that instance there, which would kind of fit in nicely with what they've done so far and probably want to do it this part moving forward here. So we'll keep our eyes on that and see if anything develops. Uh, maybe it'll develop by the end of this show. Maybe it won't. Um, but I, I would think that if if they were going to sign Bud Dupree at this point, it would happen by this coming weekend. Yeah, it's going to happen sooner than later, maybe by today. Maybe the visit is today and you know, get the physical. Um, if it does happen, I imagine it'll happen 43 seconds after our show ends. That's generally the timeline and the way this thing works. So speaking of contracts and roster bonuses, we got details out on contracts for Isaac Sayamalu. Um, Raven Clark, although that's at the one year deal that you talked about earlier. So kind of run through some of the new updated contract numbers for the current Steelers. And then we'll talk about Terrell Edmonds and the deal he got in Philadelphia. Yeah. The Sayamalo contract ended up being just slightly different than what I anticipated. It's not an even $8 million split, uh, throughout it. It's a little bit uh, higher than that. Uh, and Let's see here. His uh, 2023 cap hit is 3.616666, as opposed to I think I had it coming in like 3.5, something like that. So really not not too much difference overall in what is expected uh, overall cap hit is there. Uh, there is a roster bonus, I believe, of a million dollars. I think it's stated in 2025. But if you get if you get that far with this thing, it's a good problem to have. If you get the first two years out of him uh, at, at the average yearly value that he is at eight million dollars, yeah, I think that's fine and all. So not much really, not not a big development when it comes to that. Uh, what was the other contract? James Pierre was 1.3 million, I yeah. think. Laraven Clark was the veteran right veteran uh, benefit on that so his cap charge even with the fifty thousand dollars signing bonus is nine hundred and ninety thousand so that's that barely used up any uh any any salary cap space to get that one done is there any cap room uh salary cap update are you still working some of those numbers and waiting on some numbers well I, the, the the one that i'm waiting on at this point is the gentry numbers but uh if i throw that in my spreadsheet as what at at, at what i think his cap charge will be which is 1.2325 million once again, you're dealing with the uh, $1.35 million uh, benefit as if it is indeed a four-year qualifying contract. That's that's why a one-year deal results in his cap charge being so low in that. So if we go with my projection there, which is obviously dangerous to do, but uh, if indeed I'm right, uh, I have the Steelers at 10 Two three nine a hair over ten point two three nine million under the cap 
uh, at, at, at this point. Okay, gotcha. And so once we get the full details on Gentry and um, anything else that may come in, then we'll be able to get that number a bit more concretely. But that should be right in the ballpark of, of where this team ends up. I, I'm thinking so. And and once again, I'm I'm waiting. I, 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 I'm really interested to see if that ends up being a four-year qualifying contract on him. I think you're going to be right about that, just based on the time in for agency and the one-year deal nature of it. That That makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, should note, no, uh, not that I'm trying to sound an alarm here, but no official announcement on Casey signing, correct? The team has right. actually never officially announced that he's been signed. That could be that, as you mentioned, I think last week, he could be on vacation somewhere. He's got to come back in, get a physical, sign his contract. But just want to point that out. It's been like two weeks since that was reported, and there's no been there's not been any official word from the team. Right, and let me check the official NFL database to see if 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 it's even been. I, I don't think it's even been reported as an official transaction uh, yet. Uh, although the numbers obviously are out that that kind of stuff. Uh, no, I'm not seeing with Casey uh, any transaction in the NFL uh, database here. So. It, it's unofficial still at this point, even though I guess the numbers got submitted somewhere because they came out and they were pretty, uh, pretty specific. Mm-hmm. All right. We'll keep an eye on that whenever that becomes official. All right, Dave. Well, Mike, Mike, Mike Tomlin uh-huh. did talk about Casey this morning, though, during oh, the co- coaches okay. meeting breakfast. So uh, inevit- inevitably that that got, that got done. It's just not official yet. Okay, gotcha. Just a heads up for fans who maybe in a week from now say, oh, Casey, that's official. Didn't that already happen? Just the the heads up on that. All right, Dave, let's talk Terrell Edmonds signing a one-year deal in Philadelphia. The numbers to me are a bit confusing, and I'm going to let you kind of walk me through the whole language on this, but the initial reporting was one year, two million with some incentives, so take it away. Yeah, here's the thing with him. Uh, it is, I think, officially on the books as as being a one year, two million dollar contract at its base value. Uh, I checked with uh, Joel Corey of CBS Sports uh, because the initial kind of report from Aaron Wilson was a little bit cloudy. Uh, Jeff McLean of the Philadelphia Inquirer uh, gave uh, made it uh, laid it out a lot better in a tweet of his on on on. When was it? Sunday morning, I think. And it really looks like this thing has a max value of $2.85 million. Now, within the base value of the one year, $2 million contract, is 600000 of that seems to be fully guaranteed. 250 of that, uh, 250,000 of that via a signing bonus and 350,000 of his $1.08 million base salary also sounds like it is fully guaranteed. So, uh, the, the, uh, the key takeaway there, I think, or there, there are several key takeaways. The base value is $2 million. The guaranteed money is 600,000 and it sounds with, team improvement and individual incentives and game day roster bonuses that he can earn up to as much as $2.85 million uh, in 2023. So uh, even the max value, assuming that that is correct. And once again, Joel Corey has told me that that is the max value of the deal. That's cheap. I mean, that's uh, that's extremely cheap. Uh, when it comes to him, man, uh, you know, the big question at this point, you know, people are saying, well, well, why did the Steelers do that? Does this mean the Steelers really didn't want him? Uh, was, was Edmonds myth that maybe, you know, not getting a, you know, a, a, a better offer, assuming he did get one from the Steelers. I wrote a post about this yesterday, Sunday morning on, on, and this is, entirely speculation on, on, on my part here, but I, my speculation is Alex is that they were willing to re-sign Edmonds, but on their own terms, which obviously is not, not uh, surprising when it comes to the way the Steelers uh, do biz- business. I truly believe that they offered him another four year uh, uh, player you know, benefit contract in here uh, only with the fact that once again, the, the, the full guarantee of that would have been 
you know, $152,500 signing bonus within that. And he would have had to gone to camp to, to essentially compete for a, for a job there. And uh, look, if that would, if that indeed uh, was the deal, the, the max that he, you know, that maxed out at 2.5825 million had he signed such a deal once again, with only 152,500 being fully guaranteed. Uh, whereas, as we just mentioned, the offer from the Eagles tops out at 2.85 million and includes $600,000 in fully guaranteed money. Uh, you know, he, he, he went out and assuming that, that, that was what was offered then he took the four guaranteed and then the potential to earn more than the, the, the four year qualifying contract that he may have gotten from the Steelers. I believe they wanted him back, but they only wanted him back at the value. They deemed his value, his max value being, and I, I, along with, you know, the max guaranteed money. And I deemed that to be a four year qualifying contract. I believe that's what will we ever know that's that that's what happened? No, but I think my argument or my speculation will be strengthened a little bit if this gentry deal ends up coming in as a four year uh, mm -hmm. player player qualifying uh, contract because it, you you gotta admit it, it it is a bit curious that that the gentry deal gets done right after you know, uh, Edmund signs with the Eagles there. So, uh, once again, people say, well, why the hell are you, you guys writing and talking about this? Uh, it's obvious that, you know, uh, the Steelers didn't want him back. I don't, and, 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 and people are saying it's not a huge loss. Okay. Yeah. I'm, that to me, that's not the argument here. The argument is, did they want him back? at a right price to open up still the option for them to go into the draft and draft another safety and potentially even move on from Edmonds later on in the summer. You know, uh, I think that it would not have hurt to have Edmonds back on a four-year qualifying contract with the idea that he has to earn his roster spot later this summer. I, I don't think that that would have been a bad move. I, I said that starting a started, you know, ahead of free agency here, my hope was that they would bo uh, resign both of those guys to lower level deals and then still open themselves up for the possibility of drafting the position. Right. I think your argument is, is sound. I think it makes a lot of sense. So your idea is they were they had this offer out there for Redmonds. He doesn't take it. And so they turn to Gentry and say, you want it? Is that basically kind of how you think this thing went down? I think maybe what was out there, too, was because once again, you can uh, you can sign two players to these four year qualifying contracts. It's just mm -hmm. that the benefit is the benefit. You only get the $1.35 million in a total benefit. So maybe they were out there with Gentry saying, or Gentry's agent was saying, look, they, they probably got two of these deals out there. We can, what's, what's 1.35 million divided by two. Let, let's say they split the, we're splitting the benefit right. between, Which makes the, sense. Uh, between the two. Uh, that would have been a little less money for each one of those players. Well, if one turns it down, the, the you can give the full benefit to the other player. Right. So if Gentry's contract has like a 1.3 sign, million signing bonus, is that kind of another indicator that maybe that's how this thing went down? Or is yeah, that too, too hard to say? No, exactly. Okay. Because it's up to $1.35 million is the full benefit that the team can use as part of this team, uh, part of part of this particular contract. Additionally, the max signing bonus for each one of these guys can be $152,500. But the benefit is the key factor because you okay. only you only get that $1.35 million. You can use it, however. Uh, uh, you can, you can split it between two players. You can give two thirds of it to one player. It's just the total. If you gave that four year qualifying contract to two players, the total benefit amount is the total benefit amount of 1.35 million. So gotcha. maybe, you know, maybe Gentry side was out there saying, let's see how this Edmonds or maybe even the Steelers said, you know, look, we, we, we got the same contract out there. You know, and if, if Edmonds don't take it, we'll give you the full benefit. I don't know how the negotiations went. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, this is just a uh, uh, me understanding 
the, the specific type of contract and that, that I wrote about it mo- weeks ago that you have two players that would really qualify for this uh, that would be smart to potentially use it on. And now one player uh, got out of the picture uh, on, on Friday and the other one signed, you know, look, and if this ends up being Gentry not even getting a four-year qualifying contract, then it throws all this 10-minute talk out the window here, you know. Right, right. Well, let's put the question this way. Let's assume that's true about Edmonds. They offered that deal. Why do you think they still valued him so little? I know the market is the market, and obviously the market wasn't speaking loudly for Edmonds, only getting a bit more in terms of max earnings with Philadelphia, but – Pittsburgh couldn't give this guy, I don't know, one year, three million, something like that, just to outcompete the Eagles deal for a guy that's played so much football and I think had his best season in 2022. It's just the way, you know, my best answer to that is that's the way they do business. And uh, even had they offered a one year, three million dollar contract, how much of that would they have been willing to guarantee? And would he have then been smarter to take the full guarantee of $600,000 as as part of a base $2 million deal of up to $2.85 million where they, these lower end contracts like that, they try to keep the, the, the guaranteed money as low as possible, you know? Uh, And I just think that when they started putting pieces of their, you know, every offseason, Omar Khan and 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 uh, Art Rooney II specifically says this is a puzzle that we try to put together here, and I think they map out for certain players what they're willing to do, and they stick to that. Yeah, uh, that, that's a fair point, and and certainly the Eagles' structure on this Edmonds deal is done in a way that Pittsburgh does not structure their contracts, and so I understand why. Pittsburgh didn't match the particulars of that deal. Um, I just, I, I, I just struggle. I understand. Obviously, Edmonds is no All Star, no Pro Bowler. He is who he is. But I think there's a bit more value than this minimum. You know what Gentry may have gotten. I think Edmonds brings more value than what does that Gentry brings. And so I just struggle to understand why his price tag has, you know, for the past two off seasons been so so low. And look, they. They don't like doing not likely to be in or, you know, earn incentives and and per game roster bonuses and all like that. Now, they, you know, obviously Trubisky was a different animal last year, but he's a quarterback. Right. Uh, Mm -hmm. So you can you can you can you can qualify that as an outlier because of the position. But we've seen in, you know, as far as them uh, 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 signing non quarterbacks, they've stayed away from. Uh, uh, roster bonuses, you know, per game roster bonus, uh, you know, as much as possible as they can, even when they acquire contracts from other teams via, via trade, Vance McDonald was a, uh, uh, an example of that, you know, what that contract came to them with per game roster bonuses and all like that. And the first opportunity that they had a couple of years ago to restructure that deal, uh, to keep him around that extra season, they eliminated those from his contract. Right. Like I said, I understand certainly the the Steelers were not going to do the deal the exact same way the Eagles outlined their deal. It's just not how Pittsburgh structures their contracts 99% of the time. But I don't know. I just think you could offer this guy one year, 3 million, 500K signing bonus, get him to come back, play a thousand fine snaps as that box strong safety instead of trying to now spend either more money or draft capital replacing him. Sure. Look, I look. You, you're, you're preaching to the choir here, right. you're, I mean, and, and, and you're, you're questioning process here. Yeah, I'm just wondering how they come to that value in Edmonds. Why do they value him as that kind of real bottom tier type player when they entrust him enough to be their starting strong safety for the last what five seasons? Right. Right. I, I just think that they have a way of doing business, especially with guaranteed money, and I think that they say no matter what. This is kind of what we're going to stick to is the plan. This is the max that we want to give X player. And if he doesn't want it, well, then that's part of doing business during the offseason. Sure. That, that seems to be the most logical explanation for it. So speaking of that and speaking of Mike Tomlin, who is at the owners meetings and doing some of the media tours, had a conversation with beat writers on Sunday evening and then also during the breakfast Monday morning. Uh, Speaking again to reporters, Tomlin confirming this team will add another safety in either free agency 
or the draft did note that Patrick Peterson may get a look there in some sense, didn't specify exactly how probably some of that post snap rotation stuff, third down, obvious pass situations, but another safety will come in, which is obvious. But to me, the, the bigger question is how will they acquire that player? The free agency pool, obviously not, not looking great here. End of March, the draft class is pretty weak. There are options, but nothing incredibly appealing. Right. And as far as the Pete Peterson moving around, I mean, that's obviously an option with him, but I mean, are you really going to make him your strong guy? You know, uh, I think more, it's more along the lines of what we talked about. It get, uh, you've got a veteran guy like that, uh, who has a, a high football I, IQ that you can do some creative stuff, either, either with some inverted stuff or, 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 you know, exotic kind of robber stuff, you know, move him around where that, that in, a, in, in, in a goal to make it where Minka's less identifiable in certain down and distances. Right. I have a video somewhere on the site I did earlier in the off season, highlighting some of the post snap rotations and disguises the Pittsburgh does. And that's probably the, the most likely thing that Tomlin is talking about. So Peterson would not be used as, as a strong safety in a box role, but just some of those things where it's a, you know, a, a, I don't know, cover, what would it be? I guess a cover two invert where, you know, instead of being the, the flat defender, Patrick Peterson would cover the deep half and Minka might come down to cover the flat or something like that, some sort of trade of responsibility. That's likely what Tomlin is referring to. It doesn't really solve the issue of who's going to be your strong safety on first and 10. You want an eight-man box. Right, right. And, and people are probably going to obviously probably – and look, we we only have the, the context – of well, this just came out from Jerry Dulac, says he's versatile not only in terms of his talent, but his intellect. We're not going to be bashful about moving him around. He's, he's excited about the prospect. So that's a pretty broad – uh, 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 description. I'm sure several, uh, I'm sure this will be interpretive. Well, this guy could potentially be Terrell Edmonds replacement. Yeah. He's not going to be that. And, and I know we, we both understand that. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and Peterson, you know, was open to the idea. He said in Minnesota, he wanted to move around. They just kept him as strictly a corner. And when cornerbacks lose speed, they start talking about potential safety converts. And Peterson seems to be more open to doing something like that than say Joe Hayden ever was, who only wanted to ever play cornerback. But again, you know, Peterson is not going to fill that role really to any degree. It'll be in, in it, it's going to, re- it's going to replace more what Cam Sutton was trying to do than a, really what Edmonds was doing. Right. And look, I, you know, I think it would be sacrilegious to, to not have some instances where you try to confuse opposing offenses by putting them in a spot where, or rotating him uh, uh, pre-snap or post-snap into a position where he might not be expected. I don't think you're going to see it 20 times a game, but uh, there, there, you know, why, why wouldn't you with somebody that, that, that can be as versatile as him? Right. It's just the rhythm and the structure of the Steelers defense. And that's not going to, you know, hopefully change uh, even after losing Cam Sutton. If Demonte Casey can be that sixth defensive back, then you can really, employ a lot of rotations and he can wear a lot of hats. And, and again, I know people ask the question, why not just make Casey the strong safety? I really want him to be that dime back or that 60 B to rely on his versatility um, to really play the post. So Minka can play down and just really uh, allow a lot of options and flexibility for this defense. And, and Mike Tomlin saying on Monday that they're going to add another safety at some point uh, that could be both the via the draft and, and and free agency here too. Now I don't expect them to spend a lot on another safety and free agency at this point, but I, I do think it's possible. Uh, and it would be more of a strong safety type player. I would I would envision. I would as well. But who that may be, we've mentioned Taylor Rapp, Ronnie Harrison could be somebody else. We could go through a dozen names and try to you know guess at them. But we'll see in terms of the draft. Brian Branch, obviously the big prize there. He could be in contention at 17. Um, talked about Antonio Johnson from Texas A&M, Jordan Battle from Alabama. Again, you go through those list of names. But, you know, from once you get past Branch, there's a big fall off in the safety class. And so that's the, the worry there. Right. All right. Uh, what, else, what else do we have from Mike Tomlin? Again, he was speaking with reporters over the last uh, 24 hours or so. So what are your, your kind of big takeaways from what Mike Tomlin had to say? Well, no shocker here. They expect uh, Mitch Trubisky to stay. So I don't know how much conversation that needs. Not much. I think his the fact that he's still here 
is all the words that have to be said. He's going to remain a stealer. I've said all along, he'll remain a stealer. They will not do anything with his contract. He'll play out his contract. And that seems to be the track they're on. Uh, he talked about Larry Ogan Joby Sunday night saying uh, he expects a better version of uh, Larry Ogan Joby in 2023 uh, than we saw in 2022. And mainly because it's another trip around the block, uh, healthier this time around. And here's hoping. Uh, he speaks that into existence because if you could get uh, 2021 Larry Ogan Joby back, oh boy, what 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 a joy that would be, you know. And uh, once again, this is a Larry Ogan Joby that uh, uh, played fine in 2021. Unfortunately, he had that uh, I think it was a foot uh, foot you know, ankle, whatever, uh, injury, foot, yeah. uh, in, in, in that first playoff game against the Raiders, uh, it wrecked his season at that point. It obviously wrecked his off season, early off season as well, too, because it, it resulted in, in him, uh, missing, uh, or failing a physical, uh, and, and, and failing to get that three-year deal from the bears fast forward. It resulted in him getting a one-year deal from the Steelers at 8 million. And it was, you know, how, what he battled need, uh, toe or, or whatnot injuries last year, uh, managed to stay on the field. Thank God for most of the season, but very inconsistent play. So if you can get that, you know, I think you highlighted this. If you can get that consistency mm -hmm. factor back to Ogan Joby, uh, in addition to full health in 2023, uh, hopefully we, we, we see a lot more production from, from him. That's the goal. That's the hope. And listen, Tomlin's point is is well founded. You know, Ogan Joby wasn't signed until June twenty first last year, so that's off. You know, it's midway, more than midway through the off season, right before training camp. Essentially, you're past. You know, basically OTAs and mini camp, and he was, you know, kind of uh, not coddled, but taken along slowly in training camp. Didn't practice for the first week or so. Was you know just wanted to make sure that they brought him along at a at a reasonable pace, and so. You know, with a full off season, generally you see guys better in that second year. You just hope that he's beyond all the foot and the knee and the toe issues, and you worry about him. Defense alignment, trench guy, ton of snaps under his belt, uh, getting older, nearing 30. Will those issues go away or will they just continue? If they continue, it's going to be a problem. If he can be healthy, then certainly he can be a really effective and quality player. Right. And here's the hope. Uh, and that would help. You know, look, we still expect this team to address the defensive line position at some point during the draft by getting Ogan Joby back. Uh, uh, it doesn't force you, you know, round one to go that way, even though they might end up going that, that, that way regardless. But I think it opens up uh, the potential of, you know, not being position specific or, or round specific when it comes to a certain position by having Larry Ogan Joby back, back in the fold here now. So, uh, and you know, you just hope once again, that you, you, you get the 2021 version of him now moving forward. Dave, as you mentioned earlier in the show, Tomlin talking about the way the Steelers have built this off season roster, the direction they want to go in. Let me try to find some of the quotes here. Uh, Tomlin telling uh, Steelers.com, Dale Lawley, quote, a good running game aids the quarterback, particularly a young quarterback. I don't think we were bashful about our intentions there, and we won't be moving forward. Translation, they want to run the ball. They want big people. They want physical guys. They want to impose their will, and they want to continue and better what they did the back half of 2022. They are, they are, what, what they've done and what he said, what they've done to date, what they and 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 what Tomlin said uh, and what they did late, late last season leads you to believe that this team really wants to make a concerted effort to play some bully ball in 2023. And I'm, I'm all for that. And in doing so, hopefully that will result in uh, a safety having to come down. And then hopefully that will loosen up things maybe down the side a little bit more uh for for the passing for the vertical passing game right that's probably the blueprint and and i'm good with that you know overall in in principle in theory but this offense has to score more points i don't want to sound like matt canada here okay but, I mean, matt. This, <laughs> this offense has to okay, be able matt to put up more than, than 18.4 points per game i mean you can you can do that and be competitive and be in the wild card mix and maybe make the postseason but you're not going to beat the chiefs and the bills and all those high-flying teams in the AFC, um, if you're going to be that ground control 
kind of team. So I understand the counter correction as defenses have gotten smaller and faster to defend, you know, mobile quarterbacks and spread systems and horizontal passing game. Teams like Pittsburgh may want to try to go big and and and, and be counter to that NFL cyclical. But at some point, this offense will have to create big plays, open up this offense. Some you got a young quarterback, a franchise guy that you believe in. Um, you have to to take that model as well. So um, I'm OK with it in, in principle, but there's got to be more than just three yards in a cloud of dust. In other words, uh, don't tell me about labor pain. Show me the baby, right? Right. And I don't know, have, <laughs> have some flair around this baby. Hey, let's have a little, little, you know, uh, excitement uh, than just, you know, here's the baby. That, that's a really poor analogy, but you get my point. This offense has to create big plays in the pass game. And look, I, I, uh, I think in able to do that, they're going to have to run the football better and they're going to have to get in, in even more manageable third down situations uh, in this. And, uh, they need an, what is their identity going to be in 2023? I want them to come. I want to first three weeks of the season. I want to know, uh, I want to have a very, uh, touchable, tangible, uh, way of describing what the identity of this offense is. And I feel like coming out of the shoot, it's going to be run the ball. A hundred percent. I mean, I, I can tell you that's their identity they're building towards right now. It's what they discovered post by last year when they hit the reset button they're just trying to now put the right people in place to maximize and best uh you know be productive with that identity here's here's my question though because typically with the with the run the ball teams you get play action off of that pittsburgh's play action rates were still really low last year even post ben we thought those numbers would come up with trubisky Pickett, younger guys more mobile guys maybe guys that weren't seemingly so opposed to uh, play action as ben might have been but the play action rates were still incredibly low. And so if you're going to, I'm not somebody that says you have to run the ball to set up the pass, but generally the teams like the 49ers, the Ravens that are, that are run heavy teams, they're going to run the ball and run play action, the great big plays uh, in the vertical pass game. But Pittsburgh's going to have to get to that mindset because that's how you marry your offenses, running the ball. Well, play action, all the runs look like passes, et cetera. So um, will Pittsburgh do that? That's a big question. You know, everybody's saying, well, you know, the, the NFL cyclic, cyclical and, you know, going to go, we're going to see more uh, uh, running of the football that, 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 you know, and you know, scoring was down last year, league wide and yada, yada. And look, I, I, I agree. You could see more of that, but make no mistake that this is still, you still got to throw the football in, in, in the NFL and you still have to be able to, 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 to produce explosive plays at 20 yards or longer down the field. It's imperative because you're just not going to be able to run the football and consistently put together 12, 13 play drives for, right. for, for, I, for touchdowns. So my cons- go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, I was going to say my, my concern is just that Pittsburgh's model is going to get them to nine or 10 wins and then a quick playoff exit and not going to compete with the Mahomes and, you know, Burrow and the top quarterbacks in the NFL. Quick side note, by the way, Taylor Rapp mm. signing a one-year deal with that. the Buffalo Bills. And so the guy that I thought was the best fit headed to Buffalo. Kind of interesting. They brought Poyer back, but I guess they're going to bring in Rapp as well. Yeah, that is uh, that, that's that's another name to cross off the list at this point. I, I think uh, and look, they they might decide to let's see what we get in a draft, and then 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 add one off the scrap heap after the draft. We're almost to that point now because you know uh but i mean nothing will if there's somebody they like and they can get them cheap right now they, they should add them yeah remember when casey was signed that was a couple hours after day three of the draft we thought that everything was calming down and the draft is over and we can focus on the tape and then boom you get this casey signing so could we be in store for that happening again you can't rule that out right what else from mike tomlin day what else did he have to uh say talked about and i'm not a fan of the show that's my hot take but the the ross geller pivot on did you get that reference at all you get the joke from friends pivot oh no? pivot pivot. there you go yeah, all, right, okay. with the couch. I, all right i'm not a huge friends fan but they, um, every time you uh every time you see that in you know uh uh, when Friends is one of these, you know, the develop, uh, what was it? CNN just had the 80s sick or 90s sitcom or whatnot. Uh, they always show that friend or clip. So I, I friend that friend's clip of them trying to move that couch up the stairs. So, yeah, it's a long way for me to make this uh, reference here to the Steelers. I don't like Friends, but my uh, roommate in college watched it every single night uh, in bed. And so that's what I kind of just became accustomed to. But making it uh, relevant to Pittsburgh. Mike Tomlin talking about the pivot going from Brian Flores to Aaron Curry says he wanted a different profile. 
one of the a younger guy, although Flores is not old, kind of throwing some shade at Brian Flores. The dude's 42, Curry's 36, but a different style of coach, basically, as uh, Tomlin explaining why he wanted uh, to bring in Aaron Curry. Yeah, and I like the way he, I thought he did a good job of explaining that, saying he doesn't doesn't want comparisons to be made, you know? From, right. From, from, from the players. I mean, uh, I'm sure that still happens, right? I mean, it has to, but... Uh, uh, I, I understand the way he did, he, he attempted to describe the reasoning of it, you know, talking about, uh, and he, he threw out the example of going from, uh, uh, who's the young wide receiver, Scotty Montgomery. Yeah. Scott, Mon- Scotty Montgomery to old man, Richard Mann, old Sage. Uh, I miss this team needs a Richard man right now. <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, uh, I, I like the way that he described that. Yeah, I get it. I mean, Tomlin doesn't always do these pivots when you think about, you know, Richard Mann to the late Daryl Drake or James Daniel to Alfredo Roberts, kind of the same guy. Um, Sometimes they change it up. So I I don't know if that's really like a hard and fast thing Tomlin lives by. Uh, Bottom line is, though, hopefully Curry can be a good coach and being a former player and not that far removed from his NFL days, hopefully will make him a bit more relatable to the guys in the room. Okay, what else did uh, Mike Tomlin have to say? Uh, Jason, he talked about Jason Brooks, right? He did. The defensive quality control coach, uh, a long explanation for for that. And so um, what all did he have to say here? Quote, he has experience in analytics and quality control, also has on-field coaching experience. So he's a guy whose profile is exciting from a positional standpoint because there's a lot of behind-the-scenes work that needs to get done in order to make our days go. And went on to talk about the importance of the quality control guys just to make everyone, uh, everyone else's jobs easier and more fluid and less chaotic throughout the day so they can focus on work. Um, And so I I think there's still a bit of that overlap in the Blaine Stewart role in terms of special teams, potentially Stewart ran defensive scout team. I imagine Brooks will be doing some of that. Obviously Brooks will not be handling the receiver aspect of Stewart's title, but I think there's some overlap there in replacing what what the team lost when Blaine Stewart went to WVU to become the tight ends coach. Uh, Mike Tomlin also talked about uh, the continuity between Matt Canada and Kenny Pickett is significant heading into year two. This is just more of a kind of a continuation of uh, what Omar or what uh, uh, Art Rooney is second. And I guess to some degree, uh, Omar has said so far this offseason. Once again, uh, don't tell me about the labor pain. Show me the baby here. Right, could have already really guessed at that, and that basically just echoes what Art Rooney had to say. Tomlin asked about uh, the Steelers' small coaching staff in general, 17 on staff right now, and Tomlin's uh, quip was he'd rather overwork him than underwork him. I don't know if people will love reading the quote in that sense, but that's where Pittsburgh's at, and Tomlin essentially saying, I prefer having a smaller coaching staff. Okay. Uh, He also talked about the linebacker roles of the new linebackers, Uh, obviously some praise for Holcomb and uh, Elanda and Robert says the roles of those players will will be decided later in the year. Uh, They'll figure out the number three quarterback position at some point. This team only has two under contract. Uh, right now, obviously, Kenny Pickett and Mitch Trubisky, they generally usually like to take four to camp, right? Always, always take four. So yeah. draft pick probably and then undrafted guy probably. All right. So we'll see what happens there. Not surprising what he said about the linebacker roles. He's not going to give anything away there. Uh, let's see here. Offensive line. Something that we highlighted on quite a bit, uh, how healthy this offensive line was last year and how fortunate they were to have that happen. And it sounds like, you know, long story short, that they're not banking on having that same luck again. And thus why we've seen the attention that they've had to the offensive line early in free agency this year. And once again, uh, adding LaRaven Clark to that in, in that group of Herbig and Isaac Sayamalo. And he's not going to tell us who's going to play, play where yet. They'll figure that out, yada, yada. And we still expect this team to address now potentially the tackle and maybe even the center position. I don't know. Uh, at, at some point during the draft here. And then also along the lines of, uh, the running, which we we sort of already 
or, or the offensive line that we sort of already hit on. He was asked about the tackle position and if he's happy with both of his tackles, Dan Moore Jr. at Chiquama Core for, he says, happy is a dangerous word. I'm comfortable. So read what, read it. What do, we, what do we make of that? I have no idea what to make of that statement. That means it could be better. Uh, does that mean we're going to take a guy at 17 or 32 or, or what? Uh, I will be pretty shocked if they don't draft a tackle with one of their first two picks. That's what the, okay. I think that means. All right. Fair enough. But I do think one of the best things Pittsburgh has done this off season was adding that offensive line, at least to the interior, um, adding to that group and, and building depth and building better starters because you and I echoed, uh, all, you know, after the season ended, this team got so fortunate, so lucky with their own line. I can't believe they went into last year with like Trent Scott and Kendrick Green and J.C. Hossenauer as their backups. Talk about playing with fire. I mean, they got super lucky. So they knew that was not going to happen again. Exactly. And uh, let's see here. What else was what else was I? Oh, uh, you know, we had that talk about day one Jones the other day coming out of coming out of his pro day and all. And, you know, red flags and all uh, with him. I, I got a feeling they really like him for, I got a feeling that they, they, they like, they might like him a lot more than I do right now. And look, the only, once again, I think his tape, especially as a run blocker, uh, I mean, you, you can't miss him, you know? Uh, mm. and, and if they're, if they're going to be a bully ball, you know, uh, run the ball type of type of team, uh, especially out of the shoot 2023, you, you, you could make good arguments that it would be fun to watch Daywan Jones be part of that in some way, shape, or form. Uh, there, uh, I I have a feeling that they might like Daywan Jones outside of those red flags. Yeah, that's why I put him at seventeen in my last mock, and I got a little flack for that. Oh, that's too high. But you like a guy, you like a guy. If it's what you want to do, who you want to be, you're not gonna hope that he gets a 32 or somebody steals him in front of you. I, mean, I think he might could approach. get to 32. He could. Yeah, he could. But do you want to risk it? You, you know, if he's not there, if he gets off the board at, at 30 or, you know, 28, do you want to feel like, oh, man, you know, we we roll the dice. And, you know, if you, if you like a guy, take a guy where you want him. Who cares what the it, it's it's how many spots is that? It's 15 spots. I mean, it's it's, mm-hmm. it's hardly anything. I just wonder what this pre-draft process has done to his value overall. And uh I do still have a hard time overall envisioning him at 17. I have a easier time envisioning him at 32. A much, yeah, I, easier, a much easier time. I get that, but yet I had an easier time envisioning Terrell, Terrell Edmonds in round two than round one. Artie Burns in round two than right. round one. I mean, if you like the guy, you like the guy. And if again, even if we have reservations, if our if your thought, if our thought is they like him more than we like him, that's all that really matters because we're just sure. projecting what, what we think the team will do. Right. But once so I, again, my my my, my personal uh, thoughts on on red flags and all. Uh, you know, that's just my thoughts on him. I, I think they might like him quite a bit. Right. Which is why I say, you know, what's the reason to not put him at 17? Then, I mean, the offensive linemen are scarce. The tackles are scarce. They go earlier. Everyone's trying to get a tackle. I don't know. I just, I think 17 is a real possibility. Alex, the arm length on the last five tackles drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers, not a one of them under 34 inches. Yeah, and Pat- react to me. <laughs> yeah, that's an it's an aggressive question about arm length. Uh, Pat Meyer likes length. I mean, every offensive line coach likes length, probably. But he's talked about in the past because his system again is first significant contact, get that first punch. Having that length aids you to be able to be that guy that creates uh, that first punch. And so uh, they want big guys. That's why they brought in these big, longer offensive linemen. Even the Raven Clark, who's not very good, has extremely good length for his frame, for his size, for for the position. Um, whoever they bring in, excuse me, is going to have, you know, tremendous lengths. Okay. Now what is, where, where does the tremendous length line get drawn at? I mean, probably at 34 plus we're talking probably is going to be their, their baseline. Obviously, you know, Jones is freaky at like 36. And there's only a couple of guys that have that extreme length. Excuse me. Allergies are just killing. It's allergy season already. And I'm just like dying over here, but um I would say 34 is kind of the, the, the bar. 
okay, uh, is 33 and three quarters close enough to 34? Who are we talking about? Is this Broderick Jones or something? Darnell Wright. Darnell Wright. Yeah, just given the overall, like, he's a such a, like, a big, wide guy. I think that's – I'll make an exception there. Okay, so 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 you you could see that happening. Yeah, I do wonder if they view him where they view him best. Though he's played all over, do they view him more as a guard now that they've added guard help? Does that maybe lessen their interest in right? I I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think just the overall it, length is one figure in terms of the size profile. It's the height, weight, overall body type, what your makeup is, and and Wright's a really big dude. I'm just gonna read off some numbers. A lot of people already know Peter Skaronsky, thirty-two and a quarter, Alex. How long are He's your arms, Alex? Not 32 and a quarter, but Skaronsky nor I will be Pittsburgh Steelers offensive lineman in 2023. Okay. All right. Uh, read another one off to you. Warren McClendon out of Georgia, 34 and a half. Yeah. Uh, he's got the, what's the height weight on him? Uh, 34. Where was I? Uh, six foot four. I don't know if we got an eighth on him yet or not. I've got an asterisk next to this, but six foot four at the combine per the NFL numbers, 306, 10 inch hands. I think it's too, too small. I mean, the length okay. is good, but I just think he's going to be smaller than the guards. I don't think that's what Pittsburgh wants. Daywan Jones, 36 and three eighths. Yeah, that uh, Pittsburgh is going to be attracted to that. Uh, Paris Johnson Jr., 36 and an eighth. Man, those Ohio State tackles, unbelievable size those guys had. Johnson, much better prospect than Jones. But, yeah, that'll play well. It'll also play well in Pittsburgh streams because he will not make it to 17. Do you trade up for him? Maybe, but it's going to cost a lot. 34 and three quarters for Broderick Jones. Yeah, he's got the size. He, he, he's good to go. Uh... What's his what? the height though? A little bit shorter, I guess, but a pretty big body overall. Six foot five and three eighths for. Oh, Broderick. okay. No, that's good. Never mind. He's good then. Uh, who is the other one in here? Uh, believe it or not, as big of a boy as Blake Freeland is at six foot seven and seven eighths, thirty three and seven eighths inch arms, just under thirty four. Yeah, I mean, the size on that profile is fine. I think if you just look at the body type, though, he doesn't have that big lower half. Like you want that really big, you know power generator that Mike Mayock would talk about. So I think he's a little bit more, I don't know, leaner type that, that wouldn't disqualify him from Pittsburgh, but I think they kind of like the, the, the day one Jones at Darno writes a bit more. And who was the, uh, what was the Anton Harrison out of Oklahoma was another one. Uh, 34 and an eighth inch for him, but he's, he's obviously not a first round candidate. I don't think. Yeah, he's going to be a tier two, day two guy. What's the uh, height weight on him? Six foot four and three quarters, 315. Yeah, it's a little bit more borderline. I think they really want like a really big guy in there. Again, day one Jones, right? Broderick Jones, those types of dudes. So you, if you, if you had, if you, you know, is Darnell Wright the most questionable of, 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 of the ones we just rolled through there? Or do you I, I think he's good. Him? I, I, he gets he gets the pass for me. He gets a check mark. Okay, all right. But uh, and everybody else. I mean, uh, in other words, you would think that if it's an early tackle, you would think it's going to be either Darnell Wright. Uh, where is my list here? Broderick Jones. Broderick Day Jones. Daywan Jones. And if you got a Christmas present of Paris Johnson dropping somehow. Right. Yeah. I mean, Johnson fits. I just don't think there's any chance he's there, but those are kind of the four. Does that, that the, the list ends there, right? What's uh Bergeron from Syracuse? It, it's it's too short. Too uh, short. What's his arm? Thir- well, I mean, uh, just barely 33 and three quarters, I guess. Six foot height? five, six foot five with an asterisk next to it. We don't know the eight. So it might be six foot four and seven eighths, or it might be six foot five and Core, yeah, know, I, I just don't think I, just, I see him with the senior boy. He's a big guy. Obviously, he's pretty physical. I just don't know if he has that quite freaky size that this team is looking for. Again, the guys they brought in, Day One Jones, uh, th- there's interest in Darnell Wright. Osiris Torrance won't become a stealer, but they had interest in him before they brought in all these guards, like big people, big lower halves, you know, run blockers. That's who they want. They just want these nasty, physical, long, massive dudes up front. What was, uh, I wonder if Darnell Wright's arms were any different 
you know, because sometimes it depends on who, who who's doing the measure and all like that. What was he at the Senior Bowl? Can we pull that up real quick? Sure. If you give me just one second to see. Yeah, usually they're off maybe by a quarter inch or so. You might get a change there based on how they measure and where they actually start the measurement. But I can pull that up for you. He came in at uh, 34 and an eighth. Interesting. Okay, so we've got uh, uh, a little bit of a difference there. So, you know, it's fathomable that he could be, you know, past the measurement mustard, I guess. Yeah, I think he still passes, even if he's slightly under 34. Again, he's 6'5", 342, everything combined. He's got the size. Again, I just wonder, does they, they view him more as a guard? Do they view him as a tackle? I'm not quite sure on that one. Jones, I know they view him as a tackle. Okay. All right. Uh, I didn't mean to take you down a rabbit hole, but no, it's, it's, it's good to outline <laughs> where, where I think this team wants to go. I think I've made that pretty clear that that's, that's the body type they're looking for. Okay. Where, what do we have to cover now? What's left? Uh, anything else from Tomlin? I think might be the, the last thing here. He's might be speaking some more. I think Omar Khan's going to speak sometime later this week. So we'll see what Omar has to say and uh, any rule changes. I know there's a million proposals out there. We'll see what passes. I believe those votes are Tuesday. So hopefully by tomorrow, we'll see what, uh, if any rule changes get uh, passed. All right. We'll save that topic. We'll, we'll table that for now until we find out a little bit more what's going on. All right, Dave, let's get to some reader emails and close out today's show. All right, uh, Chris Warren. Hey, guys, I am frustrated about how this team seems to undervalue its own free agents. Edmonds is a good, not great safety, but there are good, not great safeties throughout the league, making around $5 million a year. Now we have another hole to fill, and I think it is unlikely that we'll find a safety in this draft that can give us what we get from Edmonds out of the gate. Edmonds is dependable and knows the defense. Now we have no choice but to but to find a strong safety early in this draft. Great uh, draft coverage, guys. I appreciate you. Uh, Chris, we just, you know, earlier in the show, we had a pretty long conversation about Edmonds. Uh, it's it's not, and, and we, I want to make sure we emphasize this, the, the conversations that we're having about Edmonds and have had about Edmonds are not about, oh, what a, what a disaster of a decision this was for, for the Steelers. It's more about, I feel that it's more about process and value more, more than anything. I think at the right price, even if you had to change some of your process, you could do worse for having Edmonds back in the fold for 2023. Yeah, and, that, I, and, I and that's where you're coming from, right? Right. It's not a, oh, I, you know, once again, no, nobody should be losing their mind over this. And people are going to say, why the hell are you guys spending so much time on this? But I mean, I, I get where Chris is coming from. It, it, I don't think it would have hurt to give Edmonds the same deal that he got from the Eagles if that's what it took to, 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 to bring him back. Yeah, why couldn't you give him the same deal just structured a bit differently that didn't have all the, you know, incentives and per game roster bonuses that I know this team does not want to do. They could have done that in some way that made Edmonds happy, I think. And and look, maybe they offer uh, we don't here here's sure. the thing. We here's here's the thing, Chris. We don't know what they offered him. We are and we will probably never know what they offered him or, and didn't offer him. All we can kind of do is try to read the tea leaves here. Maybe they offered him the same deal that they offered offered Casey. You know. Yeah, I, I think the important thing the fans have to recognize is it takes two to tango. Edmonds was a free agent, meaning there was no obligation to return to Pittsburgh. And my prediction, one of the very few I've gotten right in, in the offseason, was that Edmonds would leave. That eventually, we're going to just move on. And go somewhere new. Maybe he wanted to go to Philadelphia, Super Bowl contender, good defense, uh, be closer to home, you know, a couple hours from, from Virginia. So those things may have played factors as well. So Pittsburgh may have wanted him back, but there's no guarantee that Edmonds wanted to return. And that's important to recognize as well. I think what makes this such a topic now is the deal that Edmonds signed. And every and, and it was report, you know, and how it was reported too. You know, nobody's going to talk about up to two point eight seven five million like we did, right? Uh, all the right. talk is, all the people see is two million dollars. You know, uh, nobody's going to talk about the guaranteed money or anything like that. I, the 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 
what makes this the talking point is the contract, I think. And I, why couldn't the Steelers have done either match it or slightly, you know, above it to at least bring him back? Yeah, I get that. Although no one should be surprised Edmonds didn't get a lot of money in for agency. I don't think anybody I don't think light. anybody expected that to be, but I don't think anybody expected that we that two million dollars would be the talking point. No, I, I'm with you. I thought I again I'm surprised at how light that market has been for Edmonds overall. Um, but knew knew he was not gonna get paid, you know, a, a ton of money. So listen, I, I slept fine this weekend knowing Edmonds was, was gone, although 2 a.m. like tweets about his contract I could do without Aaron Wilson, um, you and me both. Uh, but just the understanding, okay, how do you replace him? He's not irreplaceable, but how do you replace him? And the money and energy and capital spent to replace him might be more costly than just trying to resign the guy. All right. Uh, let's see here. Jay Schmidt. What's good, guys? I'm the dis- uh oh, I'm the dis- disgraced guy who actually thought Malik Reed would be be the be serviceable. Uh, and he says the guy was awful. He says I was wrong. Laugh out loud. I heard an emailer complaining about Big Ben's podcast. He says it makes zero sense if Ben irritates him that much. Then don't listen and ignore all the things. Uh, that Ben says, just a suggestion instead of whining. He says, I myself love his podcast. You guys keep up the great work. Look, uh, kudos for you for coming back and 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 taking a, a spoonful of the castor oil there. Uh, we all miss, you know, we, we, we all miss at times. I just think the thing that Alex and I saw initially on tape after they signed a guy is, man, he sure seems to get swallowed up in – in a word, that's what his 2022 season was, was Malik Reed getting swallowed up and so much so even against the run that it caused him to not get a helmet in, in AFC North ball late in the season. Yeah. Um, you know, we all miss, I, like I just said, the free agency predictions, you, you should see the comments I've gotten about my free agency predictions after, after the fact they, the internet's not been very kind to me and my, my very wrongness. I thought, you know, Kim Sutton would stay. I thought Aaron Ogan Joby would go through all things that I got wrong. So we're all wrong. And uh, at they, least, they, they gotta be hitting me then too. Right. Or no, or have you not noted? Are you only I, look, looking I looked at, at my YouTube pic- channel? Oh, okay. Yeah, so it, you, uh, yeah, just stay away from any any mentions because uh, it's not uh, it's not too nice out there. But that's okay. You're wrong, and you deal with it, and it's gonna happen again, I'm sure. So yeah, Mal- the good news on Malik Reed is while it was the wrong move, bad move, it didn't cost his team a ton, so right. you, can, you can live with it. Look, I thought I thought Cam Sutton would be one of the first ones right out of the gate back. You know, uh, I thought I really liked the chances of Ogan Joby uh, going away for uh, for for basically the price that he got from the Steelers, mm-hmm. you know, right. uh, I thought my, my gut told me that Edmonds, both Edmonds and Casey would be back. You know, uh, I thought that at, at its core, at least one or two of those restricted free agents would have been tendered. I now understand why now they weren't, you know, but, uh, right. you know, there, there's, there's, you know, all you can do is read the T they, they don't give us the, the playbook in this, in these, <laughs> in these things, but, and look, we've had better, we've had a lot better off season where we've, I think last off season, I nailed all but one up, you know? Yeah. We were great last season. Yeah. It's a new GM. And so there's going to be a change there. We'll have to adjust to what was um real quick. The, the contract on Sims that, that Steven Sims got from Houston. What are the numbers on that? Oh team? yeah, that's right. Let me, uh, it wasn't, you know, much. And, and right. it is worth noting, again, players can choose where they want to go. He went home. He's from Houston. And so he gets to go to the Texans. I'm sure that was a pretty big, big draw to him. So Pittsburgh may have offered him something, but getting to go back to your, your hometown is pretty cool. Uh, let's see here. One year deal with a max value of $1.7 million. Uh, he has a $1.5 million base base value and five hundred thousand dollars of that is guaranteed so once again you get into the fact that this wasn't a lot of money overall but you got a guaranteed amount of five hundred thousand in there and that's enough to run the Steelers off yeah and again maybe pittsburgh offered something similar but if you can go back home and i bet and they offered them that same pierre contract of 1.3 million dollars that sounds about right. So, yeah, can't blame Sims there. Okay. 
Uh, let's see if we got any more of these questions out here. Uh, Dan Devlin, not uh, good afternoon, fellas. I really enjoyed the coverage. Thank you. A couple items. Not advocating Dewan Jones from OSU, but I think he played his senior year in high school. Played at a big big time program in Indy and signed originally to play basketball, basketball in the Mac. He says pretty young with, with uh, football, although your concerns are legit. Has the Steelers ship sailed with him? He asked, no, I, I don't, I, I think just because we have red flags about him. once again, as, as I tried to say that we don't know what's all, what, what all transpired in that there, you know, there, there, there's might be layers to the onion there that, that, We'll, we'll never get peeled back or anything like that. So just because we highlighted some of the, what we deem as red flags through the pre-draft process uh, with Dewan Jones, they, the, the students might not think anything of it. You know, he says, you mentioned not much interest in Skaronsky, which I assume you mean with the first two picks and highlighted size since he is smaller than Steeler guards. Do you think he could drop to low second round since guards slipped? Uh, he says, size-wise, isn't he virtually the same as Moore? Uh, he said he is a tackle. Any chance he sticks at tackle? Uh, look, I, I, Dan, I think when it comes to Skronsky, either a team's going to value him at tackle, uh, at least one team's going to value him at tackle somewhere in that first round. Yeah, he's going to be a first-round pick. He's not going to make it to the low twos. Um, he, I think he's shorter than Moore. He's certainly the arm length is much shorter. Dan Moore's, I think, 34-inch arms, and so uh, he's a lot longer than what Skaronsky was. And again, you know, Andy Weidel coming in, Omar Khan taking over, identity changing, and so the, the things of the past may not exactly be predictive of the future um, for the Pittsburgh Steelers, the direction that they're headed. So um, that that's the the thought there. Uh, he goes on to say, how would you compare Wisconsin linebacker Herbig, uh, Nick Herbig, who, 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 who he says will be a stealer to uh, the KC linebacker out of Wisconsin a year ago or so? Is he talking about uh, Leo? The KC? Oh, um, yeah, Leo Chanel. Chanel. Yeah, look, Ch uh, Chanel already had it on tape uh, off the ball. So, A, uh, you you kind of knew what you what you were getting there as opposed to to Herbig. Yeah, there was that the projection and Ch Chanel Chanel whatever his name is uh, a lot more athletic like super oh, yeah. freaky numbers. Uh, there was I think during their Super Bowl celebration he jumped back onto the bus or something like he was able to leap up like something crazy like that. Herbig is not nearly that athlete. Herbig's kind of more aggressive junkyard dog mentality than you know super you know sparky res score type numbers. So that's the overall difference. I think Chanel was, was a bigger guy, a little bit broader shouldered overall. Chanel, it, Ch Ch uh, Chanel ended up being kind of the Fred Warner of that class, right? Uh, in the sense of man, he, of his what? tape was phenomenal. And, and Fred Warner's really was too kind of guy that you wonder, man, uh, cause what Warner didn't want to end up slipping like to the third round or something like that. And what a 49ers yeah. really got a play player in that. And, 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 and where did, what, when did Leo go? I thought he went second round or something. It was like a third round pick. I think, um, I mean, he's not Fred Warner today. He's kind of just getting his feet under him and playing a little bit of football. I mean, you know, Warner tested well, but he ran in the four sixes. And so I had a terrible take the other day that, you know, speed and coverage ability are not one to one. The four four guy, you know, might be able to run and be a good athlete like Devin Bush, like Devin White, but some of the best coverage linebackers in football is Fred Warner, who ran like four six four. Shaq Leonard ran four seven flat, and so speed and coverage are two totally different skill sets and traits. Uh, Leo went third round, pick one hundred three. Okay. Uh, that what was, was his forty time? Four five something. Uh, what was it? Uh, four five three. Okay, that sounds about right. Yeah, a uh, really good athlete overall. Um, but, you know, I just want to make the point that just because you can run and you're an athlete, run a 40 time, that is a totally different thing than actually being able to cover. And look, once again, with, 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 with Nick Herbig, he's been an edge. And if indeed the speculation and really even even uh, Herbig's own words, it, it, it sounds like he's going to eventually end up off the ball. Yeah, almost certainly. The length isn't there. The size isn't there. I mean, he can rush, you know, sub packages. You can move him around, but he'll be primarily an off-ball linebacker. Now, I don't think it, you know, I, the whole brother thing and and all like, like that. I mean, I, 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 I could really see him as a stealer. 
like uh, especially if we're talking seven. The thing is now was what do you do with his stock? Because his stock has been all over the place. Yeah, I don't know for like sure. My fourth, thought was fourth, fourth round, fourth to seventh. You know, uh, I I maintain the idea that if a team doesn't view him as an edge, he's more likely to be closer to the seventh round than he is the fourth round. That's a fair point. I guess I've had fourth round in my head. I, I don't know if we'll get to the seventh. He might, um, but again, you're staring that void in the fifth and sixth round uh, in your in the face right now. But all it takes is one team to think that maybe we can do something with him as a, as a as an edge guy to, to make him a fourth or fifth round guy. Yeah, you know? and it'll probably be good on special teams, running down kicks and punts. So I think he probably goes somewhere. I don't know, fifth round, we'll say. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see if I got any more questions here before we get out of here. Uh, I think we've got uh, most of them out of the way there. So uh, we will get back at this on Wednesday, probably have a fuller recap of uh, anything interesting in the pro day circuit to report. Alex? Oh yeah. We didn't talk about Penn state's pro day. No Tomlin, no uh, con, which typically is kind of the death sentence for first round picks like Joey Porter jr. But because I assume Tomlin was either in Arizona or getting ready for Arizona competition committee type stuff, owners meetings uh, going on now that that's that, a reason there. Andy Weidel did go to Penn State along with Terrell Austin and Grady Brown and Alfredo Roberts as well, right before the Gentry signing. So um, pretty big contingency there. And I, I think an exception can be made here and still keeping Joey Porter Jr. in play at 17. They know a little bit about that kid already, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> I would say so. They probably know a lot about him. Um, I still think they like getting eyes on these guys. They were at Kenny Pickett's Pro Day last year just to, to watch the guy. Um, but I think just given the circumstances and technically a GM of some sort was their assistant GM and Andy White, at least that's that's the reporting. So um, and sending you know Grady and sending Terrell Austin re reaffirms all that. If they ended up if he ends up being the 17th overall pick for the, for the Steelers. Yeah, you could technically, I guess, put an asterisk uh, next to him, but uh, it's it's easily describable. Yeah. And the rule, I, I mean, our rule is. A, the, the head coach or the GM has to be their assistant GM is there. Eh, we'll count. It. And, and then again, given obviously the, the lengthy history of knowing Joey. Porter right. Jr. Right. Okay. Uh, what else? Uh, I think uh, any other pro days. A lot of them today. I'm getting that jet fired up. Like you said, where we got a lot okay. of scouting to do and good on you. You found a ton of guys. And um, yeah, I think we've actually had our best year ever being able to search. I don't know how many schools we're missing. I think we've gotten basically every big school so far. I think Mike Tomlin tried to put out there Sunday night that don't pay too too much attention where him and Omar uh, go. History says otherwise, Mike. <laughs> History says otherwise. All right. Uh, we'll be back at it on Wednesday. As always, you can follow me on Twitter at Steeders Depot. Follow Alex on Twitter uh, at Alex underscore Kazara. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, theterriblepodcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, steedersdepot.com, hit the uh, donate button up right navigation bar. Also, if you want an ad free version of the site, uh, steedersdepot.com, hit the ad free button up right navigation bar. Uh, good job, Alex, uh, as always. Thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.